As we get into our message today, we unify on the Bible, on Jesus, and on His mission. To walk with Jesus, we must walk where Jesus walks. Our message today is titled, Synergy. What is synergy? Well, if you look up the definition, it, 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 it doesn't sound all that good, but let's break it down. It says, the interaction or cooperation of two or more organizations, substances, or other agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. Well, what does that mean? Well, in a church setting, it means when we all come together, made differently, diverse and different, with different spiritual gifts, different backgrounds, and we come together to worship the Lord and follow Him and be part of His mission, the good we can accomplish as a church exceeds the good that we could all do individually on our own. And so unity in the church leads to us experiencing this modern word, synergy in the church. It's a great description of unity in the church. And of course, we want to see that in the local church. But we also want to see that as churches come together and as a body of believers to do things that like a conference of all the Adventist churches in Iowa and Missouri can do. And, and so synergy at each and every level. Synergy from our, our kids' cradle roll Sabbath schools all the way up to uh, conference events and the camp and all of that. And so to walk with Jesus... We must walk where Jesus walks. We unify on the Bible, of course. We unify on the Bible, on Jesus, and on His mission. That's right. To walk with Jesus, we must walk where Jesus walks. Now, what is unity? Well, let's first start with what unity is not. Unity is not uniformity. So what is on the slide that has the word uniformity? It's not a bunny rabbit. It looks to me like paper dolls. God created great diversity in nature. You drive down the road and just looking out your window, the trees and the grass, there's great diversity. There's pine trees and there's oak trees and all kinds of different trees and then grasses. And they're all different. Great diversity. In the animal kingdom, great diversity as well. The bugs hitting your windshield are all different kinds this time of year. Great diversity in the animal kingdom, in the natural world, and in the church. That's right. Unity is not uniformity. In the church, there are spiritual gifts. And because of that, God has made us all different. If you start to come across a group where everybody is doing the same thing all the time, looking alike, acting alike, dressing alike, doing all, that's more cultish than biblical. Because in the Bible, as well as in nature, God has intended for there to be great diversity. Certainly. In fact, that's why he gave spiritual gifts. Would you look at me, look, look with me, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now in verse 4, here it is. 1 Corinthians 12, we look here in verse 4. We're going to look up several verses here, or look at several verses here in 1 Corinthians 12, if you would join me there. It says, 1 Corinthians 12 now, and verse 4, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Okay, so... Notice, unity is not uniformity. There's the same Spirit, that's unity. Through the Holy Spirit, we're brought to unity, but through that, there's diversities of gifts. Differences. It's not to all be the same. We're not to all be the same. We're not to all think the same. We're not to all do the same. Verse 5, there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. So there's the unity and that it's the same Lord, but differences in ministries. Now we all have a ministry if we're called to be a Christian. That's right. Whether it's to, to share the, the love of God at the workplace or, or with your family or people that would never come to the church. And, and I have a personal ministry that's beyond being a pastor. Okay? To interact with neighbors and, and people that won't ever come to my church either, you see. We all have ministry. And notice it says in verse 5, there are differences of ministries with the same Lord. So your ministry isn't going to look like my ministry. And vice versa. It's not supposed to. It's different. And it's supposed to be. And that's okay. Unity is not uniformity. Then we look here in the next verse, it says, and there are diversities of activities. But it, isn't it interesting, we don't all like to do the same thing. That's right. Some people like to fish and golf, but some people either like to fish or golf. 
Right? Now, I'm not saying that, that that's what it's talking about here. I'm just using it as an example. And there are diversities of activities. In the church, we're going to have different things that we like. Better. Some of you like the worship service uh, better than you do Sabbath school. Some of you like Sabbath school. In fact, some people just come to Sabbath school and go home. They don't even stay uh, for the church service. But there's differences of activities, okay? Differences of activities, but it is the same God who works in all. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of who? All. So you're blessed to be different for the benefit of everyone else. That's what God's Word says on this issue. Unity is not uniformity. Look in verse 12. Here it says, and uh, we're in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. What does that mean? For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we are Jews or Greeks, whether we're slaves or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So the church is the body of Christ. Colossians 1.18 says Jesus is the head of the body, the church. And we are all compared as members in the church to different body parts. Hands and feet, uh, right? Eyes. And they're all right here. I'm not going to read all these verses, but just one example here. Verse 15, For if the foot shall say, because um, I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Think about that. If you're going to have a body, you've got to have all the different parts for it to function and do everything that it's created to do. Now, there are some amazing adaptations. I saw a, a video this week of a young mother that didn't have arms, and she was able to do things with her feet that, that astound me that, that I do with my hands. I saw her, you know, with, with her toes uh, uh, putting socks on her child. And I'm thinking, it's amazing how she's adapted. But think about it. If we were all hands, you couldn't ever go anywhere. If we were all feet, most of us, when we got there, wouldn't be able to do anything. Although this lady had developed an adaptation for her disability and was doing great in her life with her child. And so... We're created to be different parts of the body of Christ to make up the whole body. Look in verse 18. Here it is. And I've closed my Bible here, so I'll have to get back there with you. And it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 18, it says, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as He pleased. Now, I think that's a, a very important verse there. Because... God didn't make me Mark Finley or Doug Batchelor. He made me Hiram Rester. He didn't put me doing this or that. He put me here. I need to be content in the place God has put me, right? God has not made me the best vocalist singer out there. I love to sing. And if you sit too close to me during the song service, you will both discover I love to sing and that I'm not that good at it. Okay? And so, God sets us in the body as it pleases Him to do what He has called us individually to do as a part of a whole that will accomplish more than if we were just on our own. And just like, okay, so I'm not a vocalist singer, but I sing. Some people feel like, and we'll get to some of this a little later in our series, but outreach, we all have a ministry, right? We all have something to share. Some people say, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I don't have the gift of being the best vocalist, but I'm still supposed to sing when we have song service. You might not have the gift of evangelism, but you're still supposed to share the love of Jesus and His message with the people God puts in your circle. Right Now, let's move ahead here. This 1 Corinthians 12 is a fascinating read. and uh, It might be good to just spend the whole time on this one passage, but we want today just a sampling of spiritual gifts here in verse 28. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, thirdly teachers. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list of spiritual gifts, but these are rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions are questions that have a what, a, what answer, an obvious answer. What is the obvious answer? Or is everyone an apostle, yes or no? No. Is everyone a prophet? Yes or no? No. Is everyone a teacher? 
Now hold on right there. See, you might have even tried to say yes to one, two, but when you get to number three, teacher, you, you know better. At some point, maybe it was in your scholastic career, or maybe it was a seminar at work, but at some point in your life, you've had to sit through a class being taught by someone that did not have a gift of teaching. You know you have. That's not to pick on said person. The person may have even been an academic with a PhD that they're really there not for their teaching ability, but because of the knowledge they have. And it's your job to extract it from them because they're not gifted at getting it out. But, not everyone has a gift of teaching. Read on to the next one. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healings. Helps. Varieties of tongues. Okay? I said a rhetorical question. I was getting ahead of myself. Verse 29, here it is. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Do all have gifts of healings? No. Do all speak with tongues? Languages? No. Do all interpret? No. But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And so... Then that goes into the chapter on love and charity, the, the special love for others, putting others first. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's look, we're already in Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 here today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And, and you guys will have to bear with me. I'm not, not remembering right where the verse is. It's in Ezekiel though. And uh, in Ezekiel, there's a verse that tells the priest... Uh, not to wear anything that causes sweat. <laughs> so, I'm going to invoke that verse. You can Google it and find it on your phone. But uh, I've got to go preach over at another church this afternoon in Boonville. And they sit pretty close because it's a small church. And I don't want to sweat through everything completely. All right. Are you there, First Corinthians? Did you find it? Are you ready? Are you here? This is an important topic. Let's look at it. Here it is. And it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1, verse 10, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Some people read that and they think uh, more uniformity. But unity is not uniformity. Read on. But that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. What is, the, what is it, though, that, that, that's going wrong here that he's addressing? Verse 11, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Ah, that's the issue. The church has divisions, has contentions, has arguments among themselves. Uh-oh, there's a problem. Now I say this, that each one of you says, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos. Or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And so what's being emphasized here is there were cliques in the church. They were saying, oh, I came into the church through Doug Batchelor, or I did through Mark Finley. And Paul's like, who cares? That's not the issue. That's just a messenger. The important thing is you focus on Christ. He's the one that died for you. You're baptized in His name. He is the one we follow. We don't need to have divisions and cliques and all of this stuff, arguments going on. Now that doesn't mean we're going to agree all the time. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's let that develop. But remember this, to walk with Jesus, we must walk where Jesus walks. And we unify on the Bible, Jesus, and on His mission. To walk with Jesus, we must walk where Jesus walks. I remember the story of Pastor Eric Harris. I shared it a few years ago, so some of you remember it. He, was, he pastored the Kentucky Missionary Baptist Church, which wasn't in Kentucky, it was in Benton, Arkansas. I know. But he wanted his church to, you know, be on fire for God. And so he set a small fire in his church, literally. In fact, he set a Sunday school room on fire. And apparently he wasn't up to date with, you know, how fire works. Because he then wanted this to be discovered, and it just to do a little damage, and you know, then the church could come together and have a project to fix it. So after he set the fire, he went home Sunday evening to watch a football game. When he came back by his church to notice some smoke so he could call the fire department, the entire church was engulfed in flames. 
that's really not the way to bring about unity. I mean, I've always wanted my church to be on fire for God, but not, not like this. And so it says, according to a federal prosecutor, oh yeah, the law got involved, Harris said he did it because there was a division among church members and they needed a project to unify them. Turns out they, they did unify and all agreeing the pastor should be prosecuted. <laughs> well, so to walk with Jesus, we must walk where Jesus walks. We unify on the Bible, on Jesus and on his mission. To walk with Jesus, we must walk where Jesus walks. And as we come closer... <coughs> To the Lord, we come closer to each other. Now, I'm going to uh, have a couple of uh, volunteers here today to help with something. Dominic, you want to help me out up here? Tucker, what about you? You want to help me? All right, I got two excellent volunteers on the way up. All right, come on up, guys. Take your time, just hurry up. Okay, Tucker, you're over here. Don't hide behind the piano, just right over here, little father. Okay, Dominic, you're over here. Okay, now y'all can go in circles, but your goal is to get closer to the cross without getting closer to each other. Go. Oh, you're getting closer to each other. You're getting closer to each other. Oh, you're getting closer. To, okay, start over. Start over. So the goal, did you hear what I said? Your goal is to get closer to the cross without getting closer to each other. Go. That's not working, is it? You're getting closer to each other. Okay, well, all right. Thank you. Hey, hey, guys, guys, you did good. So the point being, here, get over here. You over here, over here. Wait, you're over here. You're over here. Dominic, go over here. And Tucker, you're over here. Okay, now, you're no longer trying to stay away from each other. You're just trying to get as close to the cross as you can. Go. You're still trying to stay away from each other. Just get as close to the cross as you can. I'm trying to. You're not, you're circling. You're like circling the drain, bro. See, get, get up against it. Here, like, like, like this. Can you do this, Dominic? Are you able to? Tucker, can you do this? Yeah? Good job. Boy, we almost lost that one. All right. Guys, did you notice that as you got closer to the cross, you got closer to each other? All right. You can go be seated before we, we make the church fall over. All right. Thank you, guys. Let's give them a hand. To walk with Jesus, we must walk where Jesus walks. We unify on the Bible and Jesus and his mission. To walk with Jesus, we must walk where Jesus walks. But what if, we, what if we, our view of church is like all these different roads and all these different directions? You know, what if we just come together and, and everybody's doing their own thing? You say, well, we're not, unity is not uniformity. We should all have our own thing. We should. And yet we should all kind of be going as we do things differently in a general direction. Does that make sense? And so, first of all, let's, let's ask about beliefs. So unity, we shouldn't, you know, get, have disunity over like what color the carpet should be, right? That shouldn't be an issue. And, uh, you know, make a decision, go with it. If you're not yours, then oh well, it doesn't matter. But um, we should have unity on doctrinal issues, major, major things. But there's going to be small things. I've as, as a minister, I talk to other ministers about belief and even other Seventh-day Adventist ministers, and I've discovered that if you go deep enough, I've yet to find anyone I agree with on everything. Have you? There's so many different things. Does that mean they're all wrong? Oh, that would be rather arrogant. Right? Uh, you know, my wife and I agree on a lot of things. We're both Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Uh, we both serve together in ministry. Uh, we're the parents of Lauren and Savannah and Jackson. And um, we agree on everything all the time. Do, do you think that's correct? No. That woman has a mind of her own. 
And I'm so thankful that she dies. Life would be rather boring if she didn't, right? And so, even when there's unity, unity is not what? Uniformity. And so, I remember in a Sabbath school I was sitting in at a church I pastored a number of years ago, and the Sabbath school teacher felt like he had finally figured out the truth on a topic that Adventist Christians have debated about for years. Even when we're in unity as Adventist Christians, and this is the case in other denominations as well, they have their own issues that they're studying and working through, um, there's little issues that people don't all agree on. If you think that what we believe as Adventists was just delivered in like 1863 in a nice little bundle and, and everything was all figured out, you've, you're just clueless. I did a class twice in seminary called, um, what was that called? <laughs> Development of SDA Theology. It's a wonderful history class. And I got done with it, and it was an intensive, and the professor had a final paper, and he said, just get it in when you can. And so I then saw him again a few months later. When do you need that paper, professor? Well, just get it in when you can. Well, I'm too busy to do stuff like that. I have to have deadlines. Oh, it's due tomorrow? You'll have it. I might be up half the night, but it'll be there. Well, after about a year and a half of him just saying, get it in when you can, he gave me an incomplete on the class. So I had to retake the whole class. But that was the only class. I didn't get a bad grade. I just got an incomplete. I had to redo the whole thing. And so it was the only class in seminary I had to take twice. And by far, if there was one I would have took twice as an Adventist minister, it would have been development of SDA theology. So I took it twice. I show up the first day of class and he goes, Hiram, haven't you done this already? I'm like, yeah, you gave me an incomplete. Well, I told you to get that in any time. I said, well, yeah, I just didn't have a deadline, so I didn't get it in. Well, you could have sent it to me out to reverse the incomplete. I'm like, well, I already flew here, you know, for the week. <laughs> okay, well, let's go for it. So I did the class again. I was one of the smartest ones in the room that time because I'd already took the class. I knew some of the answers ahead of time. It was really nice. <laughs> but studying the development of SDA theology, even though the Adventists, the Seventh-day Adventist Christians were unified on key things, several key things, and believed they had a mission and message to share with the world, they disagreed on a lot of stuff too. Study into the history of the Adventist church and the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah? That one didn't get settled until what? About the 1920s? About 60 years of Adventism still trying to figure out the exact relation to the Trinity? What about the topic, the nature of Christ? We're told, you know, we're not going to fully understand that anyway. Don't have divisions over it. But it was in a Sabbath school class I was in, in a church I pastored, where the Sabbath school teacher felt like he had figured this one out. And he announced that this is something we have to understand and believe. And believe it or not, it was the way he thought it was that we had to understand and believe. And he said, and if not, then Amos 3.3 applies to us. Look up Amos 3.3. 3. This, this is an interesting one. Amos 3.3 3 applies to us, he said. Here it is. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, if you're trying to find that, right? In the Old Testament there, one of those little books near the end of the Old Testament. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Amos 3.3. 3. And so he, he's talking about the nature of Christ. He presents the view, and at the time I happened to agree with the view he presented, but I was totally not on board with his application of this verse. Then he says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? And he reached the conclusion, basically, if we didn't agree with his position, then we couldn't walk together. I'm like, bro, I actually agree with what you just presented, but you just went off the reservation. Gone. That is not what that is talking about. It led to quite a discussion, but let me share this with you. To walk together, what do you have to do? Well, you've got to show up at the same time at the same place. Or you might walk the same road at a different time and never see each other. Okay? So to walk together, you've got to show up at the same time at the same place. Number one. Number two, you've got to be going the same direction. 
Let's say you and I met at the same time, at the same place, at the QT in front of Home Depot. You say, hey, you want to walk together? Sure. Let's walk together. Where are you going? Oh, I'm walking towards Boonville. Oh, where are you going? I'm walking towards Fulton. Well, we might walk together from the QT out to I-70, but that's about it. Then we have to go opposite directions. You can't walk together if you're not going the same direction. And even if you're going the same direction or the same destination, you've got to go the same route. If you leave our house on the dirt road, when you get to the end of the dirt road, it tees into a paved road. You can go left or you can go right. If you go left, you go by some scenery that's not as good, but you get out to Highway 63 two minutes faster. Then if you go right and you've got beautiful scenery the whole way, but it takes two minutes longer. Now, if I'm ahead of schedule, if I'm not in a hurry, I will oftentimes go right and enjoy the prettier drive. It's more peaceful. But if I'm almost late, I'm always going to go left and save those two minutes to get where I need to be. Well, let's say you and I are going to go to, 60 through, to the junction of Highway 63 and 22 from my house. And we're standing in the yard, and you say, we're going to walk there today? Yeah, we're going to walk there. Okay. You want to walk together? Sure. But we get out there to that T, and you want to go left, and I want to go right. We're going to the same place, but we're determined to get there different ways. Can we walk together? No. So you've got to show up at the same place at the same time. You've got to be going to the same destination or the same direction, and you've got to be taking the same route. That's what you have to do to walk together. You have to agree on those things. But if you agree on those things and you're walking together, then you can walk a long time and talk about all the things you disagree on. <laughs> together. You've got to be together, and yet you're not going to agree on everything. Now what happens if a church has an unclear mission? Say, well, everything's going different directions. You know, you end up... I've seen, I've seen churches where, where this was the case, where different ministries in the church, instead of putting their heads together to say, hey, how can we accomplish the mission? The different ministries are vying to get more of the share of the pie for themselves. And all of a sudden, you know, instead of realizing the others have a viable ministry too, and, and it, it, it begins to lead to infighting in the church. But if you've got a clear mission, ah. Eh, Things might not line up just perfect, but generally we're going the same direction. That's walking with Jesus. To walk with Jesus, we must walk where Jesus walks. We unify on the Bible, on Jesus, and on His mission. In John 17, 21, Jesus prayed, uh, Father, I pray that they all may be one, even as you and I are one. The Godhead is not one personhood. It's a triune Godhead. We've covered this earlier in the series, a trinity. But they agree in mission and purpose and vision. They're on the same page that way. Church unity. You've got to wrestle with questions like, why are we here? Are we here because we need somewhere to go on Saturday morning? Well, that, that, that could be part of it, sure. But is, is there a greater purpose than that? To, to grow in love and grace and worship God? Yes, that's, that's a part of it. To actually come together and be the body of Christ to accomplish His purpose and mission in the earth. That would even be a next step that's part of it. Why we're here. Where are we going? How will we get there? Those are the questions that have to be worked through. And of course, that's one of the reasons why last week we went over the remnant and its mission and how to share the gospel in the context of the prophetic mission that God has given to our church family. And to walk with Jesus, we must walk where Jesus walks. We unify on the Bible, on Jesus and His mission. Notice Jesus' mission. For the Son of Man, that's my Jesus, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now think about that for a moment. That was the mission of Jesus. Do you think that's still the mission of Jesus to reach lost people? You say, well, our mission is to seek Him. You're right. But as we close, come closer and closer to Him, His mission will resonate with us. We seek Him, He sought them. 
to walk with Jesus, we must walk where Jesus walks. We're going to be called into his mission to be a part of what he's doing, to be his hands and feet, to reach hurting people where they're at, to share his message. We unify on the Bible and on Jesus and on his mission. And to walk with Jesus, we must walk where Jesus walks. The cross brings unity. It is there I see how unimportant my opinions are. Oh yeah. I tend to think my opinions are pretty important. Yeah. We had a church board meeting this week. And there was an issue. And uh, the motion passed almost unanimously with one dissenting vote. I got outvoted by everybody. It happened this week. But that's not important. You know why? Because we come together, we have our discussions, we make decisions, and we work together in unity. The cross brings unity. It is there I see how important, un, unimportant my opinions are. In fact, I'm only whining about that right now as an illustration that I've been to board meetings at churches before where if somebody gets outvoted that it's a huff. That it's a stink. That it's disunity. You know what? I was able to go home and think we've got such a great group in this church. I didn't have the least bit of hard feelings against anybody that voted differently than me. And we have unity in the church because that's what the majority decided to do. It wasn't a doctrinal issue. It wasn't a huge big deal. I had one opinion. Everybody else had another one. And I think that is a beautiful example of how church can and should be. Personally. It was a blessing. You know, at the cross I see how unimportant my opinions are. It is there... I see what matters most to God. And then I can be realigned to what His mission and purpose are. How do we have unity in the church? We get closer to Jesus. We come to the cross. But unity does not mean uniformity. It doesn't mean you agree on everything. You can have a building program and two different opinions as to which color the carpet is. You take a vote, you say, that was not a hill to die on, and we move on. Somebody could have said amen, but... <laughs> anyway, y'all missed your cue. Let's do that object lesson today. Be kind of like an altar call, but different. What happens today if you come forward to the cross. Would you join me up here today? Just come stand near the cross. We won't all fit up here, but just come on up here, guys. Come on up here. I'll move my lectern out of the way here. Come, come stand near the cross. If you get all the way around it, we probably won't knock it over. Come on up here. Come on, gather at the cross. I mean, we're spread out all over the sanctuary, seated comfortably. That's a good thing. But what happens when we come up here and we get closer and closer to the cross? Obviously, this is simply a symbol for us today. No, no, there's, there's, a, whole, there's, there's a whole area here. Come on, people, let's fill it in. Gather close to the cross. If you can't come up the steps, it's okay, but step to the side and let everyone else up here. And uh, let's, let's gather. There's a whole section here. We're not actually trying to keep this for the cameras. Fill it in. Come on. We'll give you just another few moments. There's plenty of room up here still.
What have you noticed? As we get closer to the cross, of course we're getting closer to the Lord, but who else are we getting closer to? Each other. We want to have unity. We want to walk together with God. This cross up here today is just an object lesson for us, but that is the real lesson. You want to get closer together as a church and have unity. Get closer to the cross. Loving Father, we thank you for the honor and privilege we have to come to you. To be drawn closer to each other. Just like the two boys were today as they got closer to the cross. So Lord, you can draw us all and your church locally as well as around the world closer together. As we focus not on self, but on the cross. Lord, help us to think of that in our homes and the blessing it can be at home. Help us to think of the blessing it can be at church and in our lives in every way. And take that with us this week in Jesus' name. Amen.